interactively. The old is black screen, green print, with all caps. That's how old it is. I mean, you probably aren't even familiar back when everything was done that way. It's an ancient system. It was a boondoggle. It was a political boondoggle at the time. We had a chancellor who was uh, a politician, not an educator. Tacori's uh, here. And he was a wheeler dealer. And I think he had some buddies that said they could develop a system for him. And so he had them do it. And he insisted that everybody use that system. And I'm sure there were kickbacks involved. Though I don't know this for sure. This is just how he operated. The reason I know this is he's in jail right now. <laughs> okay. They didn't catch him on this one, but he caught him on other things. And he got sent to jail. I mean, he had his wife working for the system. He had his son working for the system. And he had them in positions they didn't qualify for. And they never showed up. But he, they were getting paid by the system. So he got, he's no longer our chancellor. I'll put it that way. But anyway, we continue using the system. And even though it's so out of date and everything else, well, the new chancellor is also a politician. And, but he's just, I don't think he's a, as big a wheelie dealer as this, that one was, but he said, we're going to this new system. So we're going to this new system. A few schools have already done it. Uh, it is, the, the total architecture is different. Everything's different about it. There's some things you can't do that you could do in the old system, you can't do in this one. There's other things you couldn't do uh, in the old system, you can't do in the new. But no one knows anything about it except those people. And we have been sending people down to Montgomery. I mean, more than one, two, three, four, several, down to Montgomery, spending almost a week at a time for months now learning this new system. So what financial services is trying to do is get everybody who's here. Because, okay, if you're on FAFSA last year, to get you on this year, probably to just click a few buttons. But with the new system, they've got to enter you from scratch. So that's why they say, do not, do not wait to do your uh, uh, FAFSA next fall. They're going to have to be doing all that to the new students then. And they're going to have to treat you like a new student because they've got to enter everything from scratch. Nothing carries over or it carries over well. So they've got to be very careful with it. So they're wanting to get all that stuff done for the existing students now rather than wait till next fall. So please, if you are going to be here in the fall and are going to be doing uh, FAFSA, do it now. Get it updated now so they can get it in the system now. Okay. That's posted. They said to post it. So it is. Now. Y'all aren't going to have much time for this unless you, well, you have 15 minutes, okay? The Boston State College Transfer Fair Days, the last day of it is today here on this campus. It's going on right now. Has anyone been down to it? Uh, okay. They said on the Birmingham campus yesterday it was so crowded and, huh? It was, yeah, they said it was a mess. I don't know if they improved on it here. Hopefully they have. But uh, there's a bunch of schools that came yesterday. <clears throat> but they said they had it all in one place. And it was just such a quagmire. Okay, so hopefully they spread them out a little today. But they'll be here till 1130. We get out of here at 1115. So if you, uh, you want to get down there, go down near the cafeteria. And the tables will be set up down there. See these schools, and there's a bunch of them. Okay, so uh, that delays the last day for that. And either this weekend or Monday is the last day that you will uh, have for completing your application for the uh, research experience for undergraduates that I read you about. Uh, that deadline. Is either this Saturday, which I doubt, or next Monday, which I think is probably the case, but we won't meet again before this. So this is the last time you'll hear me do this one. Now, there's other research experiences for undergraduates out there 
you'll just have to look and find them. I think they probably have them on Blackboard or a website or somewhere that you can see some of these. Some of the deadlines may have already happened. Some of them may be in the future. So check them out. They are very good things. Sponsored by National Science Foundation, so there's plenty of money behind them. They pay you stipend for them. They feed you. They, they uh, house you. They pay your airfare. It is a great program. So check into it. This one, do money. All right. Any questions? I think I got all four of you here. So let's go on and get started. We were, <coughs> we're in Chapter 4, Trigonometry, the Metro of Triangles, that stands for. Uh, 4.5, Graphs of Sine and Cosine Functions. And we're doing the modeling one, the very last example. And we almost finished it. We got the A and B part done. This is on page 303. Uh, we got the A and B part done, but had not done Part C. And what they say, uh, a boat needs at least 10 feet of water to moor at the dock. During what times in the afternoon can it safely dock? Now, these are the times of the day. Um, and this is the morning hours from midnight to 12 noon. Okay. We did the, uh, found the trigonometric model. I came up with one, the book came up with the other. They both work, okay? And then we calculated the depths at 9 a.m., which was during these time frames, and we also cal calculated at 3 p.m., which is outside this, okay? But we found it is a, a um, of course, a, trig function, a sine or cosine function, and you can look at the data here and tell that sometime around 3-ish in the afternoon, the depth gets more than 10 feet, and sometime maybe around 5-ish in the afternoon, it gets below 10 feet again, okay? So you know, even though these are morning times, because it's a periodic function, the same thing's going to happen in the afternoon. So... They say, during what times can it safely dot? Your text tells you to use a graphing calculator. Use a graphing utility to graph the model and then pick the times in the afternoon in which it uh, works for you. Okay? Thomas. maybe half the class here, no, not quite, but close, okay? And from the graph, it says 14.7 to 17.3. Well, 14.7, that's hours, to 17.3 hours. Well, 14 is 2 o'clock, so that's 2 p.m., and 0.7 of 60 minutes would be 42 minutes. So it would be 2.42 p.m. would be when it first gets to uh, 10 feet depth, and then it gets below 10 feet depth here. We'll do the same thing here, 60 times 0 0.3, and that would be uh, 18 minutes. So this will go to 5, 1700 is 5 o'clock, uh, 518. So anytime between 1240, or 242 and 518, the boat can dock <coughs> uh, if it needs 10 feet of water to moor. It better be out of there <coughs> by 518 or else it's going to be grounded. It won't get out for another 10 hours or so. So... In the past, I've tried to show students how to do that using a uh, inverse trig functions, but we really haven't gotten there yet, so it, it, it's a bit of a stretch to do that. It, it's easily done, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. Now, here's how they do it all on their graphing utility. There's a graph with the function that we have here. 
They've extended it using the trig function that we came up with. They use the cosine function, I use the sine function. Just a few minor changes there. But it graphs the same way, and then the 10 foot depth is right there, and in the afternoon it's between 14.7 7.3. Your graphing calculator tells you that. Okay. So without going into anything else, that's how they were recommending you do it. And with what we've got in our belt so far, we don't have the uh, tools to, to do the other yet. We'll get to them later. All right. Any questions on 4.5? On that one we just were talking about. Now we hit... Amari, no, we're not going to hit Amari. Okay, we're going to hit the vocabulary at the end of 4.5. This is on page 304 if you're following in your book. One period of a sine or a cosine function is one blank of the sine or cosine curve. One period of a sine or cosine function is one blank of the sine or cosine curve. Now, another word they're looking for uh, I'm trying to see if it's on the previous page. Sometimes it is under the summary. It's not showing here. Oh, and by the way, I didn't say this. There's a checkpoint after every example, so this one that we just did is a checkpoint it's out there. Uh, and oh, <laughs> The checkpoint says find the sign model for the data. I did the sign model, so we've already done that. So, uh, uh, but if you go back to the very first of this section, the on page two ninety seven, after the, when it gets into the text, actually, the first bold thing is sine curve, say again, and the second bold word says blank one cycle of the sine or cosine curve. So one period of a sine or cosine function is one cycle of the cosine or sine or cosine curve. Just a picky on words there. Number two, the blank of a sine or cosine curve represents half the distance between the maximum and minimum values of the function. The blank, right? the amplitude, perfect. Number three, for a function y is equal to a sine bx minus c, c over b represents the blank blank of one cycle of the graph of the function. Second, phase shift. shift, excellent. Number four. For the function y is equal to d plus a sine b x minus c, d represents a blank blank of the basic curve. Anybody? Say again. Okay. I don't know if you have your text, but I'm going to do it. For this function, y is equal to d plus a sine, I think it's sine, no, cosine, it doesn't matter, cosine bx plus c. Okay, for so that curve, what does d represent? Now, you may have said it right, I couldn't hear. One more time. Okay, vertical shift, okay. It was a blank, blank, vertical shift. Okay. It, it could be shifting up or down depending on the sign. Well, let's see, where is that? The sign of the S-I-G-N sign of D. Oh, and by the way, I was showing you in the book, I didn't realize. There is the, that's how they began graphing the data, okay, of the curve. That was the A part. They used the, the cosine function as a model and that this is how they went through all their pieces and we've done this we've already done that um, 
The only difference is they rounded theirs. I left the pies in there, and it became pie six, I think it was, something like that. And it's just more precise if you do that. Um, and then they rounded that too. Again, if you had left the pies in there, that would have been fine. And that was continuing the A part, which we did last time. Now, they're using cosine. I did sine, which is what the checkpoint does. Uh, and then they plugged in 9 a.m. and they got the depth of 0.84 feet. Then they plugged in for 3 p.m. That's 15 hours after midnight. So that's why they plugged in 15. And they got 10.57 feet, which was greater than 10. We'll see in a little bit. 3 p.m. was in that. And then use a graphing utility to graph the model with the line y is equal to 10. And you see that your time period we just talked about is inside that. There is the, this is the part they show you, basically. This is then the cosine function of that. And you see it, that pretty much follows many slides that okay so that's the first six hours midnight one two three four five and six or seven hours you might say and you see that very similar to what you see here okay that's this part right here what time in the afternoon just continue your model and this gets you into the afternoon and here's your 10 feet right there so these are the times that you would be above 10 feet that's how they wanted you to do the c part you're not required to have a graphing calculator but if you do it's helpful for things like this okay now we've done the vocabulary homework exercises here include any of the odds, 5 through 11, they're all at Calc Chat, 7's at Calc View. Any of the odds, 13 to 19, they're all at Calc Chat, 21 or 23 are both at Calc Chat. 25 through 29 are at Calc Chat, 27's at Calc View. 31 through 51 are at Calc Chat, 49's at Calc View. 53 through 57 are at Calc Chat, 55's at Calc View. 59 to 63 are all at Calc Chat. 65 and 67 are at Calc Chat. 65 is at Calc View. Uh, 69 and 71 are both at Calc Chat. 71 is at Calc View. 73 is at Calc Chat. 75 and 77 are at Calc Chat. 75 is at Calc View. Uh, 79. Any of the odds 79 through 85 should be at Calc Chat. Okay? 87 and 89 are true false questions. They should be at Calc Chat. Uh, 91 is a conjecture, should be at Calc Chat. 93 is a writing exercise. You can do something with that if you want to. I don't know if anything's at Calc Chat or not. And then the polynomial approximation, you can do that if you'd like. Uh, that's a calc chat as well. Uh, they have a little project here on meteorology. If that's a big interest to you, you may want to look at that and then see if you can come up with a paper topic from that. All right. Any questions on 4.5? Okay. Now, I asked this earlier, but some more people have come in. Has everybody here got a copy of the first test? Okay, 4.1 to 4.4. Uh, 4.1 to 4.4. Okay. So it's, what's it? Say this again. Oh, oh, oh. If you wanted to do uh, 95, it's a polynomial approximation. It's a little beyond what we've been doing, but it's certainly doable. 
So if you're interested in that, you certainly can do it. Uh, so we'll move now to 4.6. 4.5 was graphing sines and cosines. 4.6 is graphing everything else. Tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. And I think you'll find, well, tangent and cotangent have their own little idiosyncrasy. Whatever. A sick, can't talk, say it. Okay, but uh, secants and cosecants, even though they're a little bit weirder functions, they're really easy to graph because we've already done most of the hard work for those. I'll tell you why in a minute. So let's look. Chapter 4 is trigonometry. 4.6 graphs of other trigonometric functions. That's tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. So we'll sketch the graphs of tangent functions. We'll start with that. <coughs> then we'll do cotangent functions. They are similar in a sense but not as similar to the sines and cosines were. Sines and cosines were just alike, except the cosine is shifted I halves from what a sine is. That's the only difference. Tangent and cotangents look similar, except one flipped over and moved over. Okay, so it's got two tangents. Then we'll sketch the graphs of secant and cosecant functions. And even though they are a little weirder in the graph, they're really easy to do once you get the hang of it. And then sketch the graphs of depth trigonometric functions. Be sure you put the PED on there. Okay. The PED. Uh, depth trigonometric functions. We'll talk about what that those are and then how to do them as well. So let's start with the graph of the tangent function. Now, a few things to note about the tangent function. I've already hit these. Uh, one thing is that the tangent function is odd. What does that mean? Tangent function is odd. Whatever is happening to the tangent function on the positive side, the opposite happens on the negative side. Even functions, same thing happens on both sides. Odd functions, they go in the opposite direction. Sine is odd, cosine is even, tangent is odd. Okay? So that means that the tangent of a negative x is the opposite of what tangent x is. That means it's odd. Consequently, the graph of y is equal to tangent x is symmetric about the origin. A, an even function is symmetric about the y-axis because it's the same on both sides. An odd function is symmetric about the origin because it reflects the cross x. Okay? Now, you also know from the, they sometimes call it a ratio identity, sometimes a quotient identity, um, whatever, that the tangent x is sine x over cosine x. That should raise, raise a warning. Because you know that cosine can be zero. The cosine function starts at one and goes down to zero, negative one, up to Zero, positive one, down to every time the cosine is zero, tangent becomes a prime. Because you cannot divide by zero. So that tells you something else. The tangent is undefined for all the values for which cosine is equal to zero. Where is cosine equal to zero? We just said it started at one, so it's not when x is zero, what well, cosine is one, but where does it become zero? Interval. What's the period for cosine? Two pi. What's the interval there? I have divided by four. Okay. So at pi half, at three half pi, five half pi, seven half. In fact, all the half pi's, your cosine is zero. So therefore, and they just say here. Two of these are plus or minus five half. Those are the values for which cosine is zero. Tangent is undefined. At plus or minus five half, plus or minus three half pi, plus or minus five half pi. All the odd half pi's, cosine is zero. 
So tangent is undefined. So already we got a way to graph the function. Because what do we do at places where a function is undefined? What shows up there? A vertical asymptote. So you can start your, your tangent function by drawing in vertical asymptotes to all the half pies. Pi halves, three halves, pi, five halves, pi, seven halves, pi, nine halves, pi, eleven halves, pi. As many as you want to go that way. Negative pi halves, negative three halves, five, negative five halves, pi. As many as you want to go that way. Vertical asymptotes right there. Okay? You've already got a start on how to draw your function. Okay? So, at negative pi halves, it's undefined. At positive pi halves, it's undefined. Now, Again, because tangent is sine over cosine, where sine is zero, tangent has to be zero, right? Because sine is in the numerator. And if the numerator is zero, the whole thing's zero, right? So sine is zero at, sine starts at zero, so it's zero at the whole pi's. Zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, negative pi, negative three, at the whole pi's. I like whole pies. Okay. So, uh, you, there you have your, at, at the half pies you have a vertical asymptote, and exactly in between every half pie is a whole pie. Okay? So that's where there's zero. So you got two things done of your uh, tangent function already. You got the vertical asymptotes at the half pies, and you've got the zero at the whole pies. All right. Here is... Okay. All right. We're slowly getting a good class here. I'm always a good, good size class here. Okay? So we got that. Now, again, because tangent is sine over cosine, right? Where are sine and cosine equal to each other? Where is the sine equal to the cosine? Okay. If you remember, on the unit circle, sine is y and cosine is x. Right? So where is y equal x? On your identity function, right? What angle is that made? 45. So all of your quarter pies, the sine and the cosine, are the same, but they may be opposite signs. Okay? S I G and signs. Okay? So at pi quarters, because sine and cosine are the same value, it's sine over cosine, which is 1. And at minus pi quarters, it's minus 1. Because there, at minus pi quarters, you're in the fourth quadrant, right? Minus pi, pi quarters, you're in the Cosine is positive, sine is negative. So that makes it opposite signs, the same value, so it's a negative sign. Guess what? You got another point you can plot for your tangent function. You can do your vertical asymptotes at the half pies, zeros at the whole pies, and then at the quarter pies, to the right of the zero is a plus one, to the left of the zero is a minus one. Hey! You got a good start on the function already. You guess what? From there on, don't worry about these other things they put up here. They're just showing they're getting infinitely negative when you go to the left of zero. Why is that? Because the cosine is positive, the sine is negative in the fourth quadrant. So this quotient is negative. But they're both positive <coughs> in the first quadrant, so the quotient is positive. And you see, as you get closer and closer to pi halves, the numbers just explode. So what that means is it approaches the uh, vertical asymptote from the left, from the right hand side, it's going to negative infinity. As it approaches it from the left hand side, it's going to positive infinity. There's your graph right there. You don't have to do anything else. That's all you need. You need to know your, uh, your asymptotes, your intercepts, and those two plus or minus y, and then just draw the curve from there. We'll see how that goes. Oh, here it is right here. 
Uh, the graph of y is equal to tangent f has vertical asymptotes at your pi, at your half pi, because that's where your cosine is zero. So every half pi, negative three half pi, negative one half pi, negative or positive one half pi, three half pi, five half pi. All your half pi vertical asymptotes. Zero is directly in between those at your whole pi. Negative pi, zero, pi. Two pi, three pi, four pi. Their intercepts right there. Okay? And then, if you had done it, they could have done it, to the left of the zero, uh, exactly halfway between there, at the quarter pi, you're down here at minus one, at the, to the right of the zero, you're up here at plus one. Left of it, you're down there at minus one, right of it, you're exactly halfway in between there, quarter pi, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. Minus one, plus one. And then, connect the dots. You approach the vertical asymptote here through plus one, through zero, through minus one, and go down and approach the vertical asymptote there. This repeats itself over and over again. Now, since I just said that, what's the period of the tangent function? What's the period of the sine function? 2 pi. What's the period of the cosine function? 2 pi. But the tangent and cotangent function is just pi. Why? You think about this. Here's one reason the sine function and cosine function period is 2 pi. Because sine is plus, plus, minus, minus. So it starts over 2 pi. Plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus. Cosine is plus, minus, minus, plus. So it takes all the way around to get back to plus again, okay? But the tangent function is plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So on halfway around, is already completely unknown. So the period for your tangent and cotangent function is pi. And once you have the period, divide it by four, and those are your intervals. And where are those intervals? Minus pi halves, vertical asymptotes, your quarter pi, minus, your, your quarter pi, on, on this side is a negative one. Your halfway point is your full pi. That's going to be zero. Quarter pi on this side is going to be plus one, and then another vertical asymptote. So that's what I do. I do the same way I did before. Determine the period, pi, the tangent and the cotangent. Um, your domain, you don't have to do this, but those are where you're everywhere except where cosine is zero. So all x's except the half pi. I have plus n pi for n is any real number. Uh, no, any energy. Okay? The range, this is different. Minus infinity to positive infinity. Tangent and cotangent do them both. They go all the way. Sine and cosine between plus and minus one. Later we'll find out secant and cosecant are outside plus and minus one. But tangent and cotangent, everything between minus infinity and positive infinity. Okay? Vertical asymptotes at the half pi because those are the places the domain are not defined and it's symmetric about the origin because it's an odd function. That's it. Okay? And you'll notice tangent is always increasing. Always increasing. Now, of course, if you had minus tangent, that would flip it over into the decreasing end of the, the regular tangent function is always increasing with breaks at every vertical asymptote. Starts over at negative infinity, increases the positive infinity. Breaks at vertical asymptote, goes back to negative infinity, positive infinity. Always increasing where it's defined. Okay? Moreover, because the period of the tangent function is pi rather than 2 pi, the vertical asymptotes occur at your half pi's and the always n pi apart. So that's single pi's apart. Uh, this is half pi and three half pi. The difference of that is pi. Five half pi. The difference of that is pi. Negative half pi. That's the difference of that is pi. So n is any integer. For sine and cosine, that was two n pi. For tangent and cotangent, it's n pi. The domain of the tangent function is a set of all real numbers other than these half pi's. Okay? You can't divide by zero. The range, all real numbers. 
negative infinity and positive infinity. Those two are the only trig functions that go full range. Sketching the graphs, and then if you introduce, okay, you have an A here. I don't like putting the B here, I like putting the B outside the parentheses in C. Okay? It's similar to what you did for a sine Vx plus C minus C. The only difference is the A for sine and cosine was related to the amplitude. But remember, sine and cosine was always between plus or minus one. So the amplitude was either bigger if it's a positive number, A was uh, greater than 1, um, absolute value of A greater than 1, or it's less than, that, it's less than 1, between 0 and 1. Okay? So this was the amplitude here. Tangent goes to plus minus, minus infinity. You don't have an upper and lower limit, but it's still an important feature. Okay? And here's why. The A determined what happened to the plus or minus one with cosine, with sine and cosine, right? It had it influences what happens to the plus or minus one here. This will now become plus A, that becomes minus A. That's what it is. You don't have amplitude anymore, but the place where it was one, now it's going to be A. If the A is less than one, it's going to be a three. If it's greater than one, it's going to be a string. Okay? So these are the values that we change with A. These out here are both going to infinity. They go faster or slower, but they're still going to infinity. This is where you see your A show up. The book doesn't mention that, but it, it's true. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So that is what we're talking about the A here. The B. Same thing as it was before, except for this. How did we use B? What did it influence? In sine and cosine? The period. Okay? And if B was anything other than 1, if B was 1, the period for sine and cosine is? Period of sine and cosine. 2 pi. Okay? If B is other than 1, what is the period of sine and cosine? 2 pi over B. 2 pi divided by B. So, what does B do to the tangent function? It adjusts the period. But what's the normal period for tangent? Pi. So, the period for this function would then be pi over b. What the normal period is divided by b. And then the c, they do the c over b, and that's your phase shift. I like to divide out the b, and then what's left in there is c over b, so that's the phase shift. Okay? Uh, the sketching the graph of this function is similar to sketching the graph of this one, of sine and cosine, in that you locate the key points that identify your intercepts and your asymptotes. Sine and cosine don't have intercepts. They have intercepts max and min. This has intercepts and asymptotes. Okay? So, now here's how they do it. And it's fine. It, it works. It's perfectly fine. But it's just sort of like going around your elbow to get to your ear. It seems like an awkward way to do it. Okay? Two consecutive vertical asymptotes can be found where that thing in here is minus pi halves because if that was just the x in there, it would be at minus pi halves and positive pi halves. When you have this other thing in there, then that thing is minus pi halves and positive pi halves. It's just a little extra work, but it's, it's okay. The midpoint between the two vertical asymptotes will be the intercept. And the midpoint between the intercept and the and the intercept is going to be where your plus or minus a on every time. Okay. So the period of the function is the distance between two consecutive vertical asymptotes, which is also the distance between two consecutive intercepts. 
Okay? Uh, or two consecutive plus eight. Two consecutive minus eight. It's the, it's the same distance. That's the period. Okay. And like I said, the amplitude of the tangent function is not defined. But that A in the equation, that tells you where your function is at your quarter hops. Either plus A or minus A. It's not an amplitude anymore, but that's what you get. After plotting the asymptote, the x-intercept, plot a few additional points. The only ones I do are the quarter hops, or the quarter periods. Okay? And they are going to be plus A or minus A. Okay? Between the two asymptotes and sketch one side. Finally, sketch one or two additional cycles to the left or right. Okay. Whatever you're trying to do. So here, let's do this one. Sketch the graph of this function. Now, what was always the first question we asked ourselves was sines and cosines? What is your... Remember that form? A, da, da, B, C... Figure out what your A, B's, and C's are. This is as easy as A, B, C. Okay. What's your A here? Don't see a number. You understand it to be 1. Right? What's your B? That's the coefficient of the X. Now, what does this A? Let's back up to the A. What does the A tell you? Where the function is going to be at the quarter pies, either minus a or plus a. So just keep that in mind. No longer in amplitude, but where it's going to be at the quarter pies. Let me say this: the quarter periods. I'll put it that way. Okay. What does what's the b in this case? One half. Is that what you said? Say yes. Okay. All right. And then what do we do with the b? What does b tell us? It's related to the period. And what is the period then? If b is one half, the period is always pi, what your normal period is, and for tangent and cotangent, that's pi over b, which in this case would be 2 pi, because you invert and multiply and you get 2 pi. So now we're back at period of 2 pi. Now once you got the period, what do you do with it? Divide by 4, and that gives you your interval. So the intervals are, divide 2 pi by 4, interval of pi halves, just like we had for sine and cosine because we had a period of 2 pi. And what's your C? Do you see a C in there? No, it's zero, meaning you have no phase shift. So don't worry about a phase shift. Now, they usually don't mess around with Ds for tangents and cotangents, because, or even secants and cosecants either, because that's just a vertical elevation, so that would just lift your curve or lower your curve. So we, most of the time, we're not going to mess with those. We'll just deal with equilibrium positions. All right. So once you have the interval, that's what you're dealing with, and you have your A, let's go on and set up our sketch. Okay? So let's tick off 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or something out there. Okay? And we'll go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we'll go down 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Now, first thing I do is mark my intervals. That's why I did them. Pi halves. So this will be pi halves. This will be pi. That will be 2 pi. This will be 3 pi. That will be 4 pi. Okay? Going backwards, minus pi halves. Minus pi. Minus 2 pi. Minus 3 pi. Over here is minus 4 pi. Okay? All right. Because there's no phase shift, we're not shifting anything, 
and the Collier intervals is pi halves. And remember, it takes two intervals because tangent is an odd function and reflects across the origin. That means you need to be two intervals to the right, you'll get a vertical asymptote, two intervals to the left. Normally that'd be plus or minus pi halves, but because of that V of one half, that makes it plus or minus pi. Okay? So put in your vertical asymptotes. Now, I got into the habit of making vertical asymptotes in red, so that's going to be two, period, two intervals to the left, two intervals to the right, Two more intervals. Oh. Okay. Let's just go over another period. A period is 2 pi, so this is uh, pi. Two more pi would be 3 pi and minus 3 pi. Okay, that's sort of the easy way to do it to keep from changing colors. Okay. Let's go back to black. In between the vertical asymptotes are your intercepts. There. There and there. There and there. Okay? Now, here's where the A's come into play. At your quarter periods, tangent's usually increasing, unless you have a minus sign in front of it. So that would be plus 1 here, minus 1 there. Minus 1 here, plus 1 here. Minus 1 here plus one there, My, uh, plus one here, minus one here, plus one here, and you can't see the other. So at this point, draw your curve. That was your A, plus or minus A. So it's coming here, going like that, approaching the vertical asymptote, coming from the ver yuck, yuck. from the vertical asymptote here, goes up through here, curves around here, and then goes up to vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote, through the two points, vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote, through the two, three points, vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote, through your three points, keep on tracking. That's how you do this tangent function. It's pretty easy. Okay. Again, the A is going to tell you your quarter periods, okay? Minus on this side, plus on that side. That's the A. They were ones in this case. The B determines your period. The normal period for a tangent is pi. But because you have a B of one half, it's pi divided by one half, which is two pi. Once you know the period, divide it by four, that gives you your intervals, pi halves. So start here, and check off your intervals, pi half, pi, three half, pi half. All your intervals here, okay? Then, because the tangent is an odd function, it starts at the origin, okay? The first quarter period over here, you're at your plus A, minus A on this side, and the second quarter interval at your half interval, that's the vertical asymptote here, the vertical asymptote there, because your period here is 2 pi. That's what we found out there. Normally it's pi because you divide it by one half, it made it 2 pi. And that's how you do it. You put in the vertical asymptotes, I usually do that first, put in the intercepts exactly midway between the vertical asymptotes, and then midway between those, a minus a and a plus a. Minus a, plus a, minus a, plus a. Minus a plus a, minus a plus a, and then draw the curve through those three points and approaching the vertical asymptotes on the, either side. That's it. That's how we do the sine curve, uh, the tangent curve. Okay? That's how I did mine. Now you'll see the book does it a little differently. They go through those equations. If you just do what I said there uh, and count your intervals, you got the points where you need them. You got the intercepts where you need them. Everything's done for you. Okay? Can I erase? 
Okay. What they do They start with these equations. <clears throat> the thing that's here, x over 2, they do is <clears throat> minus 5 halves, <clears throat> same as x over 2, is e plus 5 halves. They solve those first. <clears throat> and when you do, you get uh, your <clears throat> vertical, <clears throat> vertical asymptotes, x equal negative pi, x equal positive pi. Okay? The way I would have done it was do the ABC. It's as easy as one, two, three. No, that's what I failed. Do that. Figure out your period. Uh, figure out the intervals. Just like we did with sine and cosine. You're going to have to do that anyway here. And then once you have the interval, two intervals to the left is a vertical asymptote, and the interval to the right vertical asymptote. You wind up at the same place. Okay? So two consecutive vertical asymptotes are at minus pi and pi. Okay, then this is where they do the other. This is where they take the period, 2 pi, and divide it into quarters, and that will then be at uh, 0 pi half pi, negative pi half, negative pi. At these two, you're going to class and take. They did that first. I do it now, I mean, at this point. Okay, <clears throat> the intercept exactly halfway in between, and then between these two, <clears throat> these two here and these two here at the quarter period, that's your pi halves, minus pi halves, and positive pi halves. There's your minus a plus a. Now they never say that, but that's where you use your a. Okay? Once you got one period, you got them all. And this is what they did. I did was do the interval first, 0, pi halves, pi, 3 halves, pi, go. All the intervals here. And the two intervals to the right is the vertical asymptote, two intervals to the left the vertical asymptote. You don't have to solve any equations to do them, just do it, okay? <clears throat> exactly in, halfway in between, you have your intercept, that's your 0, and halfway in between that, you have minus a and plus a, minus a and plus a, minus a. And then just connect the dots. Approaching the vertical asymptotes negatively and positively. That's it. They're skipping example two. Let's, let's go back and do example two. Sketch the graph of y is equal to <coughs> minus three tangent of. 2x. Where would you begin? A, B, C. What's your A? Negative 3. Perfect. Now here, there's no reason to do absolute value of A. Before we did the amplitude was the absolute value of A. We don't have amplitude now. Just so A is minus 3. Next, B is, nope, 2. It's the coefficient of x. Up here it was 1 half because that's the coefficient of x. Here it's 2. What do we do with the B? What does that imply? The period. And what's the period? <clears throat> what's the period? pi, because that's the normal period for tangent, divided by b, which is 2. So your period is pi halves. What do we do with the period? Divide by 4, and that gives you, so divide this by 4, and you get the interval being pi eighths. Okay, when you divide the period by 4, since the two's in the denominator, it's multiplying your denominators. Uh, two times four is eight. You divide it pi halves by four, and you get yeah. Pi halves by two would be pi fourths. Pi halves by four would be pi eighths. Okay. Your C. 
Zero. There is no C. Okay? So you don't have a phase shift. So when you go to do your graph, and I'm just real, okay, just tick off the points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Negative one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or wherever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Negative one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Now, where does tangent normally begin? Odd function, so it usually begins at the origin. Okay, so that's normally there. Now, <clears throat> we go half of a period, the period being pi halves. So, oh, wait, I didn't tack off, tick off my point. I put my intervals in pi eights, pi fourths, pi halves. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This would be pi. Minus pi eighths, minus pi fourths, minus pi halves, and one, two, three, four, minus pi. Okay. Put your intervals in. That's why we did them. Okay. Now that you've got that done, because tangent is odd, it usually goes through the origin. Because it goes to the origin, two intervals to the right is going to be your first vertical asymptote. Right? So, whoops, it didn't take. Okay, there we go. Two intervals to the right is your vertical asymptote. Two intervals to the left is your vertical asymptote. And then there's a period between each of your vertical asymptotes. So since this one is... Uh, here, a period is four intervals, right? You divide it by four. One, two, three, four. There's your next vertical asymptote. And one, two, three, four. There's your next vertical asymptote if I could draw. Okay, get your vertical asymptotes in place. Next, get your intercepts in place. They're exactly in between the vertical asymptotes. There, there, there. And there, there's your intercepts, exactly in between the vertical asymptotes. Now, here's the tricky part here. At the quarter intervals, that's where your plus or minus A's are. Now, since the A is minus 3, that first one is not up 3, but down 3. And then the one on this side is up 3 because you're, you've negated everything, so that flipped it across the x-axis. So what was tangent is normally positive, now your tangent's always negative slope. And then you do this for every one. This will be plus 3 up here, minus 3 down here. Plus 3 up here. I can't do it over there. Uh, minus 3 down here, and plus 3 up here. Minus 3 down here. Okay, so this is doing this kind of number here, approaching the vertical asymptote there, coming from the positive side, going through here, coming from the positive side, going through here, coming from the positive side, going through here, coming through the positive side, There is your graph of negative 3 tangent to x. Do your ABC. A tells you where your plus or minus quarter pi's are, the quarter periods are. Your uh, B tells you your period, you know, by manipulation. And C would just tell you if you are offset. If you had a, a horizontal shift, a a phase shift. If that C had been positive, you'd go over here somewhere else. The form for C is is Bx 
minus C. So that C is positive, you go this way. If it's negative, you go that way. Because the minus sign in front negates everything. Uh, but we haven't done one for that. So don't call that C. Then your quarter period. Okay. Your, if you don't have a phase shift, tangent always starts at zero. And then two intervals to the right to be a vertical asymptote, two intervals to the left to be a vertical asymptote. A total of four intervals, which is one period. So one period is always four intervals in one, either direction. And then, because you had a minus there that flipped it across the x axis, the word is tangent is normally increasing, this is decreasing. And at the quarter intervals, you're at plus, plus a or minus a. Because of the negation. You go in that direction. If you look in your book, you see that's exactly how they did it. Well, they didn't do it that way, but that's just exactly the same graph they did. All right. There is a checkpoint. Are there any questions on how to do tangents? That was examples one and two. So, so okay. It's pi divided by b. Whatever your b is, you divide by that. But for tangent and cotangent, it's pi divided by b. Sine and cosine is 2 pi divided by b. Okay? Well, sine and cosine of the period is 2 pi normally. Tangent and cotangent is normally just pi. So it's whatever your normal period is divided by b. Whatever the b is. B's, they almost always are positive. Okay? So... This was what you see on the board is example one. What I've written is example two. So let's just scroll past all that. That was example one graph. Now we move the graph of the cotangent function. Now, oh, I'm stiff. The graph of the cotangent function is similar in a sense. To the graph of the tangent function, only different. Okay, it also has a period of pi. That's a similarity. However, from the identity that y is equal to cotangent of x, cotangent is cosine over sine. Now the vertical asymptotes have shifted because now they're where sine is zero. And where is sine zero? Where is sine zero? Oh, y'all be familiar with sines. Where is sine zero? At the whole pi. Zero, pi, two pi, three pi, negative pi, negative. The cosine is zero at the half pi. The sine is zero at the whole pi. Okay? So that's going to shift our vertical asymptotes to being at the whole pi. X equals n pi. So n is in here. You see that the cotangent function has vertical asymptotes when sine is zero, which is at your whole pi's. Zero pi, one pi, two pi, three pi, negative pi, negative two pi, negative three. N is any integer. Now that will make your zeros of the function where cosine is zero, and that's going to be at the half pi's. So just like sine and cosine were shifted by half a pi, Tangent and cotangent are also shifted. But where sine and cosine look just alike, tangent and cotangent are kind of opposite of each other in a sense. And here's that set. The graph of the cotangent function, the normal cotangent function, just plain cotangent x, is shown here. And now you see it's always decreasing. <coughs> always decreasing. Normal. Unless you had a minus sign here, and then it flips that over and makes it increase. Okay? Your vertical asymptotes are at your whole pi. At 0, at pi, at 3 pi, at minus pi, at minus 2 pi. Your vertical asymptotes are there. It's good to go and put them in there. Just draw them in there. Okay? Uh, then exactly in between them are your intercepts. And those are going to be at the half pi. Because that's where cosine is 0. Okay? And then the rest of them we, we do very similarly. Okay? If you have a cotangent bx minus c, I don't like the way they write that, but it would be okay. 
The A is going to tell you your plus or minus quarter periods. And this is, uh, the A is 1, so that's going to be, but now it's reversed. It's plus 1 to the left, minus 1 to the right, because cotangency is the decreasing function. Plus 1 here, minus 1 here. Plus 1 here, minus 1 there. Plus 1 here. Minus one here, plus one here, minus one here. Okay. okay. That's what your A tells you. Where to put the dot in your quarter period. The B, the same as before. Your normal period for cotangent is what? Periods for cotangent. Second, pi. Okay. And the B, you do pi divided by B. That now is your new period. Okay, the C has to do with the phase shift. And as you see, the way they do it by putting the B here, it's C over B is your phase shift. So the right is the positive point. But remember, this is always a minus sign here. So yeah, it tells you what that B is. Now, period is P, it's I, just a tangent was. Domain. Unlike tangent, it's everywhere except the axis of your whole pi because your sine is zero there. Okay? The range, just like tangent, negative infinity to positive infinity. Vertical asymptote at those whole pi's. Draw them in right at the beginning. Okay? Symmetric, just like tangent, about the origin. So you see, whatever you do on this side, you do the opposite on this side. Whatever you do here, always the opposite. Now, to me, cotangent is weirder to graph. And here's what helps me graph it right. Remember, all your trig functions are positive in the first place. So cotangent, there's got to be positive there. You notice uh, intercepts going to be the whole pi. So at zero, you have a vertical asymptote. I said intercept, I mean asymptote. And at, at pi hat, you're at zero, so it has to be a decreasing function there because it's positive in the first quadrant. The only way you can get to zero is you start at positive infinity to come down. That gets me started, then the rest of them are easy. Okay. You may not need to do that, but that's my little mnemonic device, you might say. So let's do example three. Sketch the graph of y is equal to 2 cotangent x over 3. What would you identify first? A is equal to 2. Now, remember, A tells you what you're going to be at your quarter period, quarter inter, at your quarter periods, at the intervals, at the quarter periods. Okay, all right, next, B is equal to, second, no, it's not three, one-third, because it's the coefficient of X, one-third of X is X over three, all right, right, okay, all right, what do you do with the B? That tells you your period, and how do you get the period from B? How do you get the period from B? Divide it by B, okay? But divide what? Pi divided by B which in this case is pi divided by one-third, which gives you what? Invert and multiply, and what do you get? Three pi, perfect. What you do once you know the period? Divide it by four to give you the interval. Three quarter pi. Ew. Sort of a weird one. 
What's your C? Zero, because you have no phase shift here. Okay? So, draw your graph. Um, tick off your points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay? And going up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Going down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Now. Where does cotangent normally begin? What is the cotangent of zero normally? Or maybe it's better to ask it. Okay, let me put in my intervals first. This is 3 pi over 4. This would be 3 pi over 2 because it's twice that. And this would be 3 pi. It would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 pi. Okay, this would be minus 3 pi over 4. Minus 3 pi over 2 minus 3 pi, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 6 pi. Okay. Now, those are your intervals. Where does cosine usually begin? Normally it begins at infinity. Because sine is zero at zero, so cotangent would be infinite there. But positive because everything positive in the first quadrant. Okay, in the first quadrant. So therefore, let's put in our vertical asymptotes. At your whole periods now. And your period is... Uh, 3 pi, right? So that would be the next vertical asymptote would be there, and the next one would be here. Next one over here would be there, and the next one would be there. I don't draw straight lines very well. Get your vertical asymptotes in there. Always one period apart. The period was 3 pi. Okay? What's well, exactly in between every asymptote? An intercept. So those are your zeros. So you put a zero here, a zero there, a zero there, a zero there, a zero there, and so forth. Okay? Now, because cotangent in every trig function is positive in the first quadrant, it's coming down like this. So therefore, at the first interval, you're at plus 2, plus A. So there's your, uh, at the first quarter, at your first interval, which is quarter period is there, second quarter interval, you'll be down at minus 2. First one, you'll be at plus 2, second one at minus 2. First one at plus 2, can't show that one. So this one would be, Minus 2, this one would be at plus 2. This would be at minus 2. This one would be at plus 2. I don't think I can get that one in. Okay? So now, connect the dots. You come down from your, your uh, vertical asymptote, go through these points, and then approach the next vertical asymptote. Come down, go through, approach. Come down, go through, approach. Come down, go through, approach. Come down, go through, and you just keep on trucking. This one would be coming up here somewhere like this. Well, somewhere here. There you have it. The A's are going to tell you where you're going to be at your interval. First and third intervals, your uh, quarter periods. Okay, you're going to be at plus a or minus a, and the, the uh, 
A is positive here, everything's going to follow normally. So your cosine will be positive in the first quadrant. That means it's going to be plus 2 there, minus 2 over here. And then the pattern continues. Your intercepts are going to be at the places where your sine would be 0, which since there's no phase shift at your uh, whole periods. Your period here, well, let's go back and do the V. V gives you your period, which is 3 pi. So normally the intercepts would be at your whole pi's. Those would be at your 3 pi's. Okay? So 0, 3 pi, 6 pi, minus 3 pi, minus 6 pi, so forth. Okay, in between those are your intercepts, and in between those are your intercept and your asymptote or your plus and minus x. So let's clear this out of the way. Now they go about it differently. If you like their way better, by all means do it. Okay, if you understand that better, do it. They started off by doing zero and pi because that's where your asymptotes are for your cotangent function. At zero and pi. That's the first two places where sine is zero. So that gives you 0 and 3 pi. Same thing we got, they just went about getting it differently. See, two consecutive vertical asymptotes occur uh, every 3 pi apart. Is it time? Okay. All right. Um, let me just go through this quickly. This is how they do your... They, I did the intervals, they're doing the intervals. They just don't call them that, okay? 3 pi divided by 4 is, is 3 quarters pi, so 0, 3 quarter pi, 3 half pi. 9 quarter pi, I didn't say what it was, but that is. And that's where plus or minus a is, as you see right there. So this is your graph, looks just like ours. Maybe not quite as pretty, but close, okay? Plus or minus a. All right, we'll start next time with graphs of the reciprocal functions. Well, actually, cotangent was a reciprocal function. But we mean the secant and cosecant. Reciprocal of sine and cosine. So we'll pick up there. Let me give you a few homework exercises. Everybody got your first test. I think I asked that before. Homework exercises here would be, I would do all of 9 through 14. Now, only the odds are in the back of the book and at Calc Chat, but you should be able to match. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Do your A and your B. Don't worry with, no, A and C. Don't worry with B, D, E, and F because we haven't done secant. So your numbers will be 10 and 11. Those are the two that we've done, tangent and cotangent. Don't worry about the others yet. And then on the next group, do any of the odds 15, no, do 15, 19, 27, 29, because those are your tangent and cotangent. They're all at Calc Chat. 19 is at Calc View. Uh, you should be able to do 39, 40. Oh, 43 does have a phase shift to do that one. Um, and 47. Okay. You should be able to do 49, 51. They're both at Calc Chat, 51's at Calc View. You should be able to do 59 and 61. They're both at Calc Chat. Well, we'll pick up the rest of those later. Okay, good deal. Have a good weekend. Of course, working on trig will make it good, right?